Let us pray together. Lord, we pray that you would take us, diverse people, and bring us into a circle where you are the center. Cause us, O oh Lord, to see you, to open our hearts to you, that you would be the one who receives all of the praise and the honor and the glory. For we say to you, speak, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I wish you who are in the congregation could have been with the group that was over in the great hall. We were getting ready for the procession. The thing that I noticed was that everybody was beaming. They were so excited to be here. And <laughs> with good reason. It's been a long haul. There have been a lot of hurdles. So in some ways this kind of feels a little like graduation. But I, I want to say to you today that um, this is also a count the cost moment. It is both an arrival, lots of preparation has happened, but it is also, in fact, an inauguration into something that is quite large. In fact, it's really much bigger than any of us, much less bigger than just the four of you. Because, as you could tell, could we not, that all of this was overlaid with a tremendous amount of tradition and pomp and order about it, solemnity to it. They have to sign a declaration. People have to speak on their behalf. There should be no sense in this service whatsoever of, gosh, we need a leader. Who are we going to pick? Well, let's pick you. Uh, and how are we going to do this? Well, I'm not sure. I guess we ought to pray for them, shouldn't we? And kind of call that ordination. This is anything but that. This is just the opposite. This is these four, called by God, surely, taken through their paces, surely. You'll attest for that, won't you? For the express purpose of them being invited into something that takes us all the way back to those who were called in the book of Acts to wait on tables. Which is why there is this deep level of servanthood that rings through particularly both the epistle and the gospel reading. If you are looking, the four of you, to be involved in some kind of ministry that somehow gives you a, a sense of privilege, you've made a huge mistake. Because as anyone, including the four of you, will know, that it's not merely servant in the way that we think of, say, perhaps a butler. The Greek word is doulos. That means slave. And there's actually nothing very pretty about it. It's darn hard work. And in fact, just to underscore it, <laughs> in the gospel reading, did you get this? When they were talking about being ready, they even included the third and the fourth watch. That means the middle of the night. It means all of us being, as it were, on call for Jesus to use us regardless of time, regardless of place, regardless of sacrifice, regardless of responsibility, because guess what? That's what he did. Not just that's what he did, that's actually what he is doing. That the ever-living Messiah who sits at the right hand of God the Father, as the scripture says in Hebrews, lives to intercede for us. And that within the context of our space and time means round the clock. He never gets a day off. But you see, nor would he want one. Not that you shouldn't take a break now and then, understand. But the fact of the matter is, is that the heartbeat of slavery is unequivocal availability for both the God who has called you, as well as to the people that you are called to serve. That's actually the heart 
of diaconal ministry. Because you see, it's not just you. There is a kind of typology about this. You're, the order is in fact bigger than you are. And because that's the case, people overlay on you an extraordinary level of expectations. In fact, more than you could ever accomplish. But there is still within that something that gets imparted to you that is never meant to leave. You know, the shorthand is once a deacon, always a deacon. Once a deacon, always a deacon. Once a deacon, you priests, always a deacon. That at the heart of who we are is that profound availability for whatever it is that God asks of us. Because that is in fact the very nature of slavery. I give up my right to control my own life. I now come under the authority of one who has absolute sovereign control and authority to tell me whatever he desires. And my job is not to say, are you kidding me, Lord? Instead, my job is to say, okay, here we go, yes. But yes, knowing this is important, this is why you have the Jeremiah reading, knowing that you are fulfilling a divinely appointed spot. That God not only created this great legacy of servanthood into which you have been invited, that we call deacon, in the life of the church, but while the very sovereign plan of God was being was creating this place of ministry in the life of the church, God was also taking you from wherever you are and saying, oh, okay, this one's going to belong to me. So that at God's appointed time, the tradition of servanthood and who you are as one reborn into the life of Christ would come into the same place together. That's what this means by this being a divine appointment. Diaconal typology, the spirit of Christ inside of you and all that he has done are formed together to express the unique ministry to which God has called you. So that Lisa's diaconal ministry actually won't look quite like Tanya's or Jada's Tommy's. And that is as it should be. We're not, you see, brought into something where we act like I don't know, somebody that we're not. But there is in fact a kind of death to self that really does occur so that I might be available as Jesus chooses to use me. Because you see, the heart of servanthood, and this is what Paul begins to get at in the epistle reading, it is not just proclamation. It is a kind of embodiment or to put it in our language, if the people looking at us don't see the walk, they're sure not going to pay attention to the talk. Both have to go together. <laughs> and it means in such a way as, oh my gosh, how can I do that? And the good news about it is, is that you can't, except by God's divine appointment. Because there will always be this gap between that which you proclaim and who, in fact, you are. And no one will know that better than your spouse and children. But the good news of it is, is that, as Paul writes, we have these treasures in earthen vessels so that the power of God might be seen very clearly as not coming from us. And so God chooses to take the broken people that we are and to manifest his life. But what Paul is very clear to say is that that life which is manifested is both lordship and servanthood, both at the same time. Uh, Leonard Sweet, which I love, puts it this way. Jesus comes in the surround sound of paradox. Lion, lamb, first, last. And you see, so do we. On the one hand, we come literally filled with the very same spirit which raised Jesus from the dead. But how do we express that? In tyranny, oh no, we were gentle among you, as Paul writes. There's a leadership that allows the security of power to be expressed 
primarily in the washing of feet. Did you hear that? That's important. There is a security of power, God's power within us, that gives us the freedom, you see, to wash feet. I, and for no other reason that we're in fact called to do that. In other words, what we're not doing is that we're not trying to do some act of generosity so that somehow they're going to like us or to manipulate people into doing something for us or to flatter them by our attention. That's exactly the kind of cunning, to use the epistle word, that Paul chooses not to practice. If your servanthood is ever meant to be an end to do get something from it, you're in the wrong business. For that, and believe me, the temptation is enormous. Anybody in ordained ministry will tell you. But it is from that for which we need to regularly repent. Because that's not servanthood. That's manipulation. We choose to renounce that kind of, Paul's word, cunning, and instead choosing to freely give, leaving in fact the results to God, and being available God to use us regardless of what the results look like. Sometimes we see it, sometimes we don't. And to be, as it says in the Gospel reading, available to do it literally whenever it is asked of us. How do you do all of that? It only works in some way if you understand that you have been united in Jesus Christ and you are there by divine appointment and because that's the case you're willing to say yes. Not because you necessarily feel like you have it in you. If you're relying on somehow feeling as to whether or not you have it in you, you won't get out of bed. Sometimes most mornings. Even showing up in and of itself is a servanthood act of faith where you're counting on Christ to manifest himself through you and for his glory and for his glory only. Anything other than that is either manipulative toward them or flattery and pride toward you. So saying yes to slavery for the sake of Jesus is really the heartbeat of what's happening today. It's, it's solemn in that sense. You're saying in essence, yes, I really am willing to lay down my life. It's not just academic preparation. I've made the time to really pray this through. And I know a cost is being asked of me today. And I'm willing to do it. Is it always going to feel like a lot of fun? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but will there be joy in it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. There is nothing more satisfying to actually see God operate through you in a way that touches the life of another person. There's nothing sweeter. I mean nothing. And for that there is extraordinary joy. So, about to be deacons, Lisa, Jada, Tommy, Tanya, would you please stand? As your bishop, I give you this charge. Always understand that you're called to be slaves, servants. And when people complain, and you complain about somehow feeling used, well, guess what? That's what servanthood feels like. Therefore, it is critically important that you make the time to stay intimate and tender in the very presence of Jesus. Because that is, in fact, where the grace comes from. If you're looking for other people to give you the affirmation you need, you will fail. They will not do it. And if you need that too badly, you'll crave flattery, which means you'll manipulate people to get it. And that's not diaconal ministry. That is not servanthood.
There is a reason that Jesus, who was despised and rejected by others, kept going away again and again and again to be in the presence of his heavenly Father. Please listen and see his example. So that no matter how hard it is, and it will be hard at times, there will be inside of you that sense of his companionship, where your heart is refreshed, where he gives you the things that you need. And as a result, even in very barren places or very rich places, God will move through you for his glory for the extension of his kingdom and for that sense that you will find inside of you that says, yes, it is to this that I have been called. May that always be your joy even as you stand, kneel, and wash feet as the deacons you will always be. Amen.